Hey, what's up, everybody? Hopefully you can all hear me and see me. Uh, I never know with YouTube. It's kind of a crapshoot sometimes. Um, but here I am. Um, so, hey, uh, we had a, I, I wanted to do a live stream. I haven't done one in a while. Uh, and part of the reason, too, is we just have a lot to talk about. So uh, to kind of kick off the conversation, um, we had a bunch of uh, news come out. Obviously, I released a video. We, we got the little snippet from... Uh, from the show, <laughs> um, and in the the table read, which I loved, I, I have to say I was really really uh, excited after the table read, probably more so than I was going into it. And if you've watched my videos, you know I'm fairly excited about it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I I'll I'll hit on a couple of quick things that I said during the video. But for one, I loved the way that Maureen, sound, or I should say that Rosamund sounded as Maureen. I just, I thought that was on point. I heard her talking and I thought, Phew, that's her. Um, so I was really, really excited about that. Uh, I, I love, I, first of all, I, I, I know one of the criticisms of Marcus mm -hmm. was that he was smaller um, or didn't maybe look the size apparent. And it looks, uh, at least from the way that they shot that, that he seems to be getting pretty big. So that that's a certainly a positive because I do think of all the characters, I think Perrin is the one that his physical appearance matters maybe the most uh, in regards to the plot because his physical size kind of is is the catalyst for his character and who he is. So um, yeah, I, I just thought that would be, um, it was really good to hear a line from um, from Barney Harris as Matt. And the reason I say that is he's the one that it's actually the hardest to find clips of. Uh, uh, when I when they did the original casting, I went and researched all of them, and and he's the one that you can find the least speaking parts for. And so I thought it was really cool to even hear one line from him. So I, I loved that part. Um, outside of that, it was really cool to just kind of see them all in a room and finally doing it. And it was great. And so obviously there was a lot of speculation there because uh, it appeared that Michael Michael Hatton was uh, there. And then of course, what character is he? So I addressed this in the video. I don't want to rehash the whole thing. Uh, most of you have probably seen it, but uh, we did, we did get some confirmation uh, on that. So that was a good thing. And Hey guys, before we, we get too far into this, uh, if you don't mind it, can ever, if everybody is watching and you don't hate it so far, if you want to go ahead and like the video, it really helps uh, the YouTube algorithm actually tell people that I'm doing this uh, when you do that. So um, thank you for all of you. If you can take a second and just hit the like button on the video, that'd be great. Um, and uh, so, hey, I, and you know what? Before we get too deep, I want to I want to plug uh, some other Wheel of Time community members here real quick. Uh, just before we get too much into this, uh, I am all about growing the conversation and the community around the Wheel of Time. And there are some new YouTubers out there uh, that are getting their start. And I think it would be awesome if you all could give them a follow. I'm going to link, uh, I'm going to link, first of all, the one that I, I love listening to. It's more of a talk show type thing, the Dusty Wheel. Some of you have heard of it. Some of you haven't. I'm going to link that in the description. Uh, definitely give them a subscribe. Um, they're, they're awesome. A lot of them, if my understanding is correct, it's a lot of the guys from the old Theoryland website, which was outstanding. So I put that link there. Uh, if you guys want to, I would love to give them an extra, you know, a couple hundred subs or a thousand subs or however many we can get going. They're great. I, I called into the show. They do, uh, they do more of a talk show. So it's, it's pretty cool. So definitely check them out. One of the other new Wheel of Time YouTubers out there, um, I dig his accent a lot, uh, Wheel of Time Theory. He does some really in-depth good videos. I'm going to link that in here as well. Um, if you guys want to give uh, him a follow, um, I think he does great work. Um, he does real short snippet clips, and they're, they're, they're great. So certainly want to check that out. And then for those of you who like music, I had a... Uh, I had a Wheel of Time community member that makes and composes music reach out to me about a couple songs uh, that he had written uh, and composed that he thought would be great for the Wheel of Time. I listened to them and I thought these are pretty awesome. So I, I figured I'd share that with you as well. Um, so there is another YouTube channel. So I have linked three YouTube uh, channels in the, in the description there. 
Um, but I always do want to give a shout out to people that are uh, hopping in this community. Uh, it's not competition. It's the more that we can get people talking about this and and everything that's, you know, that's the positive. So uh, you've got those three there. I know there are others that I've missed, but uh, that's that's where I'm at right now. Those guys are all getting their start, pretty small channels, as some of you are saying. But, you know, let, let's, let's help them not be small channels anymore. And the one way you can do that is to give them a subscribe, like their videos, like them, and, and go from there. So I uh, just thought I'd throw that out there to you all. Um, so anyway, oh, by the way, if you haven't seen, I'm wearing, uh, we, we got some merch on the channel. Uh, some of you had been asking about it. We've got actually a lot more coming in. These are the first like batch. I have a mug. Um, is it self-serving to have uh, myself on a mug and wearing a shirt with my own picture on it? Probably. Uh, <laughs> but um, anyways, you can see the links to that in the description too, guys. If you uh, want to check out some of the merch, it does support the channel here. So back to topic. Uh, I did. I'm sorry. I wanted to make sure we we shouted out uh, those other folks. So uh, I want to get to some of your comments here in a second. I just kind of want to prompt a lot of it. Uh, what the the other news that we got about the show was? I think there was some. It's not officially confirmed that that was Michael McElhatton in the um, uh, in the table read, but I think we can go ahead and with certainty say that it is him. Um, in fact, Dusty Wheel did a great job of matching up physical facial features and probably the icing on the cake or the thing that seals the deal. He wears a, a wrist, um, a bracelet. Why am I forgetting what that's called? A, a bracelet uh, in a lot of his interviews, and he is wearing it in that video. So I think we can say um, that that is him for sure. Um, for those of you who hadn't seen the video or hadn't heard that rumor. So the next question is, who is he and who do you want him to be, is the bigger question. My my initial thought before the video was released was this. So, and I will revise my opinion because there was new things that came to light after that. Uh, I sound like, uh, sound, like, uh, sound like the big Lebowski there. Uh, new things have come to light. <laughs> but, uh, so first of all, when I released the video earlier, I was under the impression that was just uh, episode one because that was all they had showed. Rafe came out and said that was episode one and two. So episode one and two does change uh, who it could be a little bit more. My initial thought, and it wasn't necessarily that this is who I wanted him to be, but it's, it's who made the most sense for it to be to me was Tom. Um, and I know that's a little outside the box pick for Tom because he's always played kind of these bad guys for lack of a better way of putting it or stoic, whatever. Um, he does have a voice that could probably pull off Tom. Um, I thought it was Tom because of the way that he looked. He was a little lighter skinned than the rest of the characters. And if they were setting the two rivers up to be darker skin, which they have been, uh, it made sense that he would be Tom because that's the only other major character that could be in the first episode that we hadn't heard already. Now, there are two other characters that I think it could be outside of that. I think it could be Tam. I'd be fine with it being Tam. It just doesn't necessarily make sense if they wanted to make uh, Tam darker skinned. I, again, I don't know. We're just guessing. Um, the other two characters, though, that I think it could be. Number one, I think it could be Pat on Fane. Um, it would be a little interesting take on Pat on Fane, honestly. Because um, I, I don't... I, it's hard to see Michael Micklehatton. He's a calculated evil, not a psychotic evil if you want to think of it that way, sort of like Thane is. Uh, Moradin, or Amaya, is the other character that I think it could be. Uh, and I think he would be an outstanding Ashama because he is the calculated evil, which is what the Forsaken are. Thane is more of a psychotic, crazy, all over the place. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think he's kind of a sophisticated, he might be too sophisticated to play Thane. And I think that's why I initially didn't want to go there. So, um, I, I think it could be him. Now, if we're adding in a second episode, there is a, a thought that he could be Jeff from Bornholt. Okay. And while that is a possibility, I feel like that's such a minor role for a character like that, unless they are expanding that. So any case, so I see somebody saying a uh, spoiler warnings. Uh, 
I, I'm usually uh, known for being fairly good on spoiler warnings. I have a system for it on my videos. I, I will go out on a limb and say, guys, on this video, it's going to be very difficult. We're not really getting into anything crazy here. Um, I will let you know if we're going to dive into like super deep spoilers for down the road. But we are talking generally about the the uh, Wheel of Time TV show, and that's going to involve discussion of the first season. And so if you are afraid of, of seeing any spoilers for the first book, uh, I apologize, but that's what this video is going to be. So, um, okay. So let's start with one prompt question. Who all do you think that Michael McElhatton will be? I'm probably, again, butchering that name. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Somebody let me know. But who could you, who do you think he could be? Who do you want him to be? Okay. And then um, outside of that, what are some things? Because I know there's been some pictures that have come out of shooting and rivers and things like that. I just love to hear your general thoughts on the show and where it's going. So let me hit on some of your comments. I am notoriously horrible at reading them. Uh, so if I miss you, I apologize, uh, but I will try to get to them. Okay. So I see some people saying, obviously, we got Fane, Tom, Loghain. I don't think he'll be Loghain. Um, and it's not just because he doesn't fit the, the description of Loghain. I just... Um, I think they're going to go for somebody more attractive to play low game. And it's not to say that he's not, but I think they want to look for kind of a younger, um, more physical presence type for Logan. I would think. I would assume that would be it. Um, now, Logan has an expanded role. They could be, guys, the, the caveat to all of this is they could be changing the story. And you have to be okay with that as part of the adaptation, like, some of these characters could take it. They could take a different angle with Fane, for instance. They could take a different angle with Jeff from Bornholt. Maybe he'll have an expanded role. Um, so we don't really know that. Okay. Um, you know, I see people say to Gareth Bryn, uh, and I think that's a possibility. It just it doesn't seem to me that he would be in that first or second episode. But then again, as I mentioned, they are they could be showing us different different parts of the world in those first two episodes to kind of bounce around storyline or plotline wise. And if that was the case, we might see him. Um, I do not, I do not believe that we are going to see a linear story in the same way that I of the world works. I, I do not think that um, mainly because later on. So really from the great hunt and more so dragon reborn and on, in the books, what Wheel of Time does a great job of is having a bunch of different plot lines going on simultaneously that all kind of weave together. Eye of the World is basically following the same plot line. That doesn't lend itself very well to television. Uh, if you look at some of these bigger shows, they've got different plot lines going on in different places, different characters for us to follow, to become invested in. They're going to have to do something like that, I would assume, uh, with Eye of the World. And so I think they are going to show different things going on in different parts of the world. And that would lend us to see somebody like Gareth Brynn in the first episode, even though he's barely in the first season. Now, unless they're really going to expand that role, I would not see them casting a high caliber actor like Michael McElhatton. He's not an A-list actor by any means, but unless they're going to make him a major role, like he's going to have some type of a major recur recurring role. Okay. So Elias Matura, again, it could be. He, he could be an Elias Matura. I just I feel like he's more on the sophisticated side of things rather than um, kind of the wild man type, if that makes sense. Okay, so I've hit on a couple of these. The first episodes might show the capture of Loghain by the Red Aja. I, I agree. Um, in fact, I think that would be a great... I, I mentioned that in, in my video. I really do think that if we're going to expand Loghain's role, we need to show who he was. Because I think Loghain potential... And guys, some spoilers here. Um, and this is spoilers for not just the first season, but way down the road. So again, earmuffs if you don't want to hear. But uh, <laughs> Loghain has the potential to have one of the better arcs in the story because he was a, a false dragon. He uh, desired power and he did it because he thought he was actually going to be the leader. He actually might have even thought he was the dragon reborn. Um, so he, he was a minor noble. He was kind of full of himself. He was a powerful individual. You can see him be completely stopped 
humbled. And I think we need to see, I don't want to call it the brutality, but borderline brutality of the Red Aja or brutality of what they're forced to do with men that can channel. Um, and seeing him have that power stripped away from him, becoming a broken man who doesn't see a future. And then moving on to seeing um, uh, how he transitions to becoming the head of the Black Tower, the one of the more powerful figures in the world, that type of thing. He has the he has the uh, the ability in the story to have a really good arc, but to do that, you're going to need to expand his story, and it's got to start with we have to meet him and see who he was prior to the gentling. Is my my opinion at least. Um, I'm curious your thoughts on that. Um, so okay. Links to photos of the Trollocs. I, I don't, somebody, I don't have links to the photos of the Trollocs. So if that, if those exist, I don't know about them. <laughs> um, I know there's a picture that we have some assumptions that are Trollocs, but I don't know that that's confirmed. Uh, I think they could have Fane telling the story of Loghain and fade to his story. Oh, okay. Um, possibly Fane telling that. I, I don't know if there'll be. Uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, I don't think that's what the the style that we're going to see. That's a little bit more think Lord of the Rings, with you've got the opening of, you know, you've got Bilbo or Frodo writing out the story of. Uh, I think it's um, Bilbo writing out the story of the Lord of the Rings, and I, I don't think we're going to see that, guys. I, I we are all indications to me are that we're going to see a much more quote unquote gritty retelling. Um, I would say more in the style of Game of Thrones than we're going to see in the style of Lord of the Rings. I know some of you will not like that take, but I do think that's what we're going to see just based on what, like for instance, uh, I already know based on the casting calls for Nynaeve and Egwene, they, they cast them saying there would be nudity. Uh, I know that's a controversial issue for a lot of you, but there's probably going to be nudity, uh, quite a bit of it. So this is already going to be kind of a grittier, more adult take on these books than uh, the books are not G-rated. Whoever said that, I don't know if. Um, oh, stop! Oh, Badger Reborn is one of my mods being trying to troll the channel, saying it's G-rated, and he knows better. Uh, don't believe him. Don't listen to him. Try to troll. <laughs> um, they are very R-rated. Um, I would say, at least in the in the regards to the way the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm says that. Uh, so any case, uh, I'll read some of these comments here. Again, I've got Badger Reborn here or, or Ross J trying to troll um, or Trollic. He's trying to Trollic the uh, chat. So, okay, back on topic here without no more trolling. Um, yeah, it, it certainly is R-rated. I don't know that we want to get into that discussion again, but I, it is going to be that way, okay? And so because of that, I think storytelling tropes like having a narrator kind of talk back and tell us, walk us through a story, that, that's not quite as much of a uh, gritty storytelling motif or, or, or trope. So I, I just don't see it being like, hey, we're going to read loyal story. I don't think that we're going to see that. I think it's going to be a little bit more gritty in your face, a lot less exposition and a lot more showing what's happening. So I think we're going to see some cutting back and forth. And again, I could be, I am totally guessing here. These are not me talking from knowing exactly what's going on, but that's what I think is going to happen. I'm, I'm, I watch a lot of shows and I read a lot of fantasy books. It's not just real time. And I'm basing a lot of my opinions on what you typically see. Okay. What about having the narration of quote unquote, the wind uh, just at the beginning as part of the intro. Okay. Uh, I, I do think now this is an interesting topic and we don't have anything on this. I can't wait till we get a teaser trailer. I want to know how they're going to open the show. I would be shocked if we didn't see some type of the wind um, being a part of this, where you've got the wind that started here and blows around. Like, I'd be shocked if we didn't get that as the start of the individual seasons um, or as a part of the way they open the show. I am really, really interested to see how they're going to open the show. Um, 
So real quick reminder, guys, if you are if you are in, in here now and just hopped on, if you don't mind uh, throwing the video a like, it really helps YouTube share the, the fact that I'm even doing this right now. Uh, and so it'll bring in some more folks. So if you can smash the like button there on the video, that would really help this out. Um, so I, my thought, as I was saying before, I've said this in my, my video with Daniel, um, my vision of how they might open the show, uh, I really think the very first scene, I do think there's a possibility that we are going to get the uh, prologue. And I say that only for this reason. The name of the show is Wheel of Time. For all of us Wheel of Time fans, we know what the Wheel of Time is. If I'm a viewer that has never watched or, I'm sorry, never read the books before, and I hop on and I see something called the Wheel of Time, there's going to need to be some type of explanation of sorts of what that means. So they're going to have to set up why there's a Wheel of Time, how that works, why the show is called that. And I think they can do that by cold open in the show, doing the, the, the prologue, having that whole thing where, where Luz Theron creates Dragon Mount and the world, the breaking of the world starts. And you see Tarvalin, the island that it's on, formed in that very opening scene. And then gradually, we we can see the world in almost in a time lapse changing. Um, I, I think, th th at least in my head, this is a way that that could happen. I don't think it's going to be exactly that way. But I think very much we could see the world changing and that's a part of the wheel of time and that could lend itself or, or move itself into um, where, where we start the story really in the two rivers. Um, and I, I think that would be a cool way of doing it. I really am interested because like Game of Thrones intro is iconic. Uh, people know the song. They, they know the, the buildings popping up and it's like a game on a game board. Like that's, that was the motif they were going for. Um, but it, it, I don't know exactly how they'll do it, but they're going to have to do something, and I'm excited to see what they're going to do. I'm curious what you all think about that. So, okay. I hope we get the prologue at the end of the first... See, I think that's the other place we could get it. I think we could get it before we need to um, set up what the Dragon Reborn even is, okay? Because that would be a part of it. Um... Michael McElhatton is Luz Theron. I think that's a possibility for certain um, that, that 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 could happen. Uh, it would be an It would be weird because we still don't know how they're going to portray Luz Theron throughout. Like, is he just going to be the voice? Um, be interesting. Oh, Billy Zane. Uh, honestly, even though I love Billy Zane, I don't want him to have anything to do with it. Just because that thing was so bad uh, that he was a part of. But hey. Supposedly, it's in his contract. I don't know that I believe that. That seems ridiculous to me, but who knows? So how long has this thing been going? I'm not sure what you mean, MK. What thing been going? So, okay. Oh. Yeah, well. Uh, my moderator, the live stream itself. We've been going now for, for a little bit. We've been on here about 20 minutes or so. Um, but uh, any case, so Rafe shot down Zane reprising. I didn't see that, Rachel, but uh, I, I kind of hope so. I, I, don't, I, I, I don't, again, Billy Zane is not a bad actor by any stretch of the imagination. I don't like him for a Shamael at all. Uh, I think he would be better if he was going to be somebody else. I don't know who, but I, I definitely don't want him to be a Shamael. And yeah, any case, I just don't, I, I wouldn't mind seeing him again. He's a good actor. I, he really is. Uh, Asmodian, I could see that. Yes, absolutely could see that. Um, that might not be a bad idea for him, but definitely not as Shamael. Um, okay, so moving off of casting a little bit. Um, what? I, I'm interested. Oh, thank you, Stubble McShave. Thank you so much. We got a donation here. The prologue would would also serve as a promise to the viewers about where the series will go concerning scope. Agreed. Uh, I, I think it's important. Here's why the prologue is important, and I think why Robert Jordan included it. Because um, I think it does, you know, we can talk about this in the book sense as well. It 
it sets up the scope of what's going on, of what's been lost, and then we go back to focusing on this small area. So I think having the prologue in some way, shape, or form included does change the scope of the series to the viewer to kind of understand what's going on, who's doing what. Um, is this? Are we just focusing on these couple kids, or is this going to be a bigger world type deal? So I absolutely think the prologue uh, I don't necessarily want to see it cut. Let's just put it that way. I don't. Um, but I'm also interested to see how they do it because I know that's controversial for a lot of folks. They didn't like the prologue in the books. Now, I love the prologue in the books in hindsight. It's great as a reread because you go back and you see all these little Easter eggs in there that I think are really cool. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. I could begin with Moraine and, Sw and Swan attending the Amarlin with a keeper. So basically you're talking about the beginning. Sean is talking about uh, the, the show could start with uh, the opening to New Spring. I don't think that we will get that. I, I think they need to keep Moraine's motivations secret. Um, and I think they will. This is one thing I caught that I didn't hear a lot of people talking about. But let's listen to the – think about the specific lines that they said uh, that they were reading in that table read. We've got Moraine basically saying, hey, if you want to turn back now, you can't do that. Now, we know he's not talking, she's not talking about a Gawain turning back because Gawain wants to go. So she's probably talking to Matt or Perrin or Rand. And why would they be having that reaction to her? Well, she sinks the ferry after they cross it, which is what, what would prompt that conversation, which then you hear a line read from Rand saying, is she, is she any better than what's chasing us? So they're clearly going to go in and play into the tension of they're not sure if we can trust Moraine. And I think they're going to play that up to us as viewers, that we're not sure if we can trust Moraine. Because Moraine is doing her own thing. So I don't think they want to give us at the beginning. I don't think we need Moraine's motivations, because that would make us as viewers know too much. So I don't think, that's kind of my long way of saying, I don't think we're going to see New Spring until much later on. Uh, if they even do that flashback, just because we don't need to know why she's doing what she's doing yet. I think that's part of the mystery that we will learn later. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's the way I would see it. And I think that was an important piece of that table read that I don't see people talking about a lot, is how they are setting Moraine up to be a not not super trustworthy, at least to the to the kids. So... Um, you assume she was talking to Nynaeve. See, I, at that point, I don't I don't think Nynaeve is there. Now, they might have Nynaeve uh, leave with them. I don't think so. I think it makes sense to keep Nynaeve showing up later on. But who knows? Yeah, she says you're not a fool, so she can't be talking to Matt. Now, well, oh, we certainly know Matt is your favorite character, right? Wink, wink. Uh, uh, but... I don't think, I agree. I don't think she's talking to Matt. I think it could be Perrin or Rand. Um, and I think she's using uh, manipulation techniques because she knows darn well they're not going to turn back. That's why she said that she isn't really giving the option. So, uh, when do you guys think, I throw this out there because I know we're talking about it, but when do you all think New Spring, will it ever be incorporated or when will it be? So, I see a couple of you saying that, that she's talking to Nynaeve. I don't see that. Uh, I don't see her talking to Nynaeve at that point. Um, it's possible that she is. But, uh, again, she would have been fine with Nynaeve turning back. Um, she she wouldn't have tried to convince Nynaeve to stay at that point. I, I think it makes a lot more sense that they flipped out on the fact that she sunk the ferry. I think, that's, I think that makes more sense as to what's happening there. I can, I'm sorry, guys, got so many uh, messages, so I apologize if I don't get tears. I can see the opening of Wheel of Time starting with the breaking of the world in a similar way. Cities popped up at the opening of Game of Thrones, ending with the creation on Dragon Mount. I agree, Michael. That's kind of how I envision it happening. Um, seeing, showing the slow play of time about the 3,000 years over the course of uh, um, watching the breaking of the world, which, by the way, is a super interesting topic to me. I was talking about this uh, in my, my server in my Discord server, which, by the way, guys, if you want to be a part of our Discord, we have a Discord server. We have these conversations. Uh, to me, it's kind of like the new message boards. I was a part of, like, the Dragon Mount or the Watt Mania, for those of you that remember it, message boards. 
The new way of doing that is Discord. We just get in and have live conversations. Um, I'm fairly active in it. You can see the uh, link to my Discord server down below. Just click it and join. It's really easy. Even if you don't know how to Discord, you'll learn. It's easy. Um, and it's a lot of fun. So, And if you don't mind, yeah, smash the like button on the video as we're sitting here just because that does help uh, YouTube promote this. So if you are new in the live stream, hit the, uh, hit the like button on the video. Um, if you don't mind, that'll really help with this. So, uh, any case, uh, back to what I was saying though, on, um, the age of legends, I, one of the topics I am fascinated by the age of legends. I, I love the idea or the concept. I think part of the reason I love when, when Rand goes through what we call the way back to Rungrial and Roydeon, uh, I love seeing the history of the IEL because we get to see snippets of the age of legends and sort of the fall of the age of legends that that to me is super interesting like how that could have happened how you go from being so advanced as a society to literally having society fall apart and having remnants of people that still know things uh and then moving on to a place that's totally distant from that so you've got because again we're talking about a society that like as we're advanced they're even more advanced like way more advanced than we are Things are like energy is plentiful, like the one power supplies energy. Uh, food is not a problem. Um, to move from that to a place where even the snippets we see at the end of the war of power, they're still able to grow food. There's still constructs like the Nim. There's still Ogier. There's still the one power. Then when the, the male channelers go insane, my first question is how come the women couldn't team up to kind of stop the men? Because the men can't essentially team up with each other, right? So how did the breaking get as bad as it did to the point that not only was society destroyed, but knowledge was destroyed? Um, the world was destroyed. Like, how could that have happened? And, and obviously, there's ways that you can kind of get your brain around that to see, because part of it is they didn't even know. Like, they didn't know what the taint was at first. Um, they knew people went crazy, but then it was kind of a slow burn. Uh, the breaking of the world took about 200 years. Uh, if you want to see, I've got a video on it. But, um, you, you know, watching the fall, I guess, uh, of that. But then you move into this area where we've got, and here's what I think is kind of cool about the way Robert Jordan did it. We've got society, after the breaking ended, you've got the Ogier finding their steading, building the ways. You've got society starting to come back together. You've got the compact of the Ten Nations, which... Those nations were far stronger and more powerful than any of the uh, nations that we have now in the books. Like you've got, that's the Manethran, the, um, uh, I think it's called Sa Safer or Safer or whatever. You've got all the different um, lands, Coromanda. Um, and then you've got the Trolloc Wars. So about a thousand years after they started to basically recover, right? The Trollocs invade and destroy most of the countries. The world basically follows, falls apart. Um, I look at that as sort of like the burning of the library at Alexandria, um, which they said set the world back a couple thousand years because of uh, they had all this knowledge. They were starting to reaccumulate it, and then it was destroyed. And I kind of look at it the same way. I think that's what the Trolloc Wars were. So any case, I love um, seeing that fall from power to then rising again. And we get to see that um, the fourth age is sort of moving back towards not necessarily the age of legends, but a different age, which is kind of cool. I just think those would be really cool. Um, so it brings up this question. I see some of you talking about this anyway. And so uh, I figure this is a good one to talk about. If you could see uh, an outrigger novel or you could see uh, an expansion or a, uh, let's call it this, let's call it a, um, a new storyline that we would explore from the, with the wheel of time, a new show would be made. What would you want? Uh, I would love to see the fall of the age of legends, um, or even that first, the 10, the compact or the, the, uh, Trolloc, excuse me, Trolloc Wars, or maybe even Arthur Hawkwing. Or maybe you could see something afterwards. You could see the Sean Chan con conquest of the other land. Like, what would you want to see? What do you feel like would be cool? Um, I would love to see the War of Power. That would be very cool. It would be so different. But 
Guys, here's the things. I know Amazon has the rights here. Um, if this show is a success, we're going to see that stuff. That That's part of why I'm so pumped about this. Like, we're probably going to see some of this stuff. So I'm really excited that if this show, if they do a good job of this, we're going to bring in fans. Amazon's going to throw more money at it. And when the show ends, hopefully, and again, this is wishful thinking, but we're going to see more. So I'm excited. And I'll say one last thing. There is not a better place. The only place that I could see uh, this going on that I would be okay with as well would be HBO. But even then, like, there's nowhere right now that will spend the kind of money that they need to on a show like this other than Amazon. So I've done a lot of research on the topic. Amazon is, I'm pumped that this show is going to be on Amazon. So, okay, let me hear, hit some of your comments here. What what are some of the things that you would love to see? I see some of you saying the IO War, Trolloc Wars. So a lot of the things based around the wars, the rise and fall of the Age of Legends, uh, some of the Forsaken. I agree with those. Um, which Game of Thrones is getting spinoff shows, Ross. Uh, so I, I do think – now, just so you guys know, Robert Jordan had planned on doing a spinoff show of Matt and Tuon um, with the with the Sean Champ, uh, which I know could be controversial, but he had planned on doing some Outrigger novels on that. So I, I, I think it's possible we'll see some stuff. Um, Anthony Crane, Watt merch would be great. Now it's not necessarily Watt merch, but you can get your Nameless merch in the in in the uh, description below. My favorite, actually, of the merch, by the way, um, my favorite one is the Chosen shirts. Uh, I can't wait. I've ordered mine, uh, even for myself. I'm geeking out on my own merch. But um, first of all, big shout out to Leon for making all this stuff. He's awesome. Yeah, MK, you got it. Um, who do I think will have the first cameo? Rafe, Brandon, or Harriet? I don't think any of them will make a cameo. Stubble. I don't think any of them will. Because I don't think any of them want that spotlight. Uh, I could see Brandon wanting to be in it or geeking out. But I also think he feel, he'd feel like he was taking the attention away just knowing who he is. Um, so, well, I don't know if we can make your the, – the shirt that you designed for me is, is maybe not G-rated enough for YouTube. So, Okay, I think Rafe would. He's already been on Survivor. He has been, but that was a reality show. I, I don't see him making a uh, cameo. I just don't see it. Uh, I, I Okay, so Ed Sheeran's cameo on Game of Thrones was awful. I'm, I, I'm, I'm all, I'm 100% against cameos. Uh, totally against them. So... RJ had a book cameo as an Ungreal. Yes, he did. Good catch. He absolutely did. Um, you think Harriet would, Jesse? Uh, Harriet would love to be. Uh, what What makes you say that she loves it? I, I'm I'm interested to see that. I, I I have not noticed that about her. So, how will they handle Egwene's enslavement, John? I think they'll show it in full on. I don't think they're going to hold back on it. And in fact, I think they're going to make it as bad as it, as it could be. This idea that because those topics like slavery is bad, um, rape is bad. Those obviously those things are bad. I don't think they need to avoid putting them in the show. They need to put them in the show because they're bad. Um, it brings up those discussions like the Sean Chan to me are an outstanding anti-hero. Is really what they are in the books. And I say anti-hero for this reason. There's very little redeeming qualities about the Sean Chan. They obviously fight for the side of the quote-unquote light good guys at the end, but there's very little redeeming about them. But at the same time, you can also sort of understand how their culture evolved. Okay, And the reason that they don't view it as bad Um so I don't think they need to make any effort to make us think that the Sean Chan are at all good and what they're doing is okay. In fact, I think showing the horrific parts of that type of slavery uh, with the Gwaine's enslavement, I, I think is good. Um, so 
I, I think those types of discussions are good ones. I, I don't think they should shy away from that. It prompts conversations. It prompts us to talk about it. It prompts us to hate them and then at the same time like them. And I, I think you don't get good characters like Aginan, um, understanding that her people or her worldview has been is wrong. You don't get that without first establishing how horrible it is. So that's why I'm all for it. And that's why I also don't want to see them dumb down the violence of Dumai's Wells. I want Dumai's Wells to feel disgusting because I think that drives home the point of what that's meant to be and the reality of the way that would look and how war would actually be if magic was a part of it. Okay. Sean Chan history is a one-to-one -one with American history and it is. Okay. And that was deliberate. Um, if you want to know how deliberate that was, Robert Jordan said that he had imagined the Sean Chan accent as a Texas accent. <laughs> so if that gives you a better idea of it, um, the Sean Chan are America in Robert Jordan's eyes. They aren't bad people for the most part. It's how they were brought up. It's their whole world. They don't know any difference. And you're right. That, that's why it's, it's their worldview. And part of that, guys, the reason that's such a good discussion is how many of the problems in our world are, are from the fact that people are brought up thinking one thing and don't understand a worldview outside of theirs, but how that could be offensive on that? Like, you can pull examples of that from everywhere. You really can. So, oh, thank you so much, Alan. Uh, love the live, missed the first half. Love my channel. I thought you said you love my chin there for a second. I was going to say, I have two chins. So, uh, but thank you so much for the uh, for the donation, man. I appreciate it. Um, but the complexity of villains, and I've actually got a video in my kind of backlog of videos I have to make here. I, Daniel beat me to it, but you know me. I, I like to go in depth with this stuff. I've got a list coming up of the best villains in the Wheel of Time. And I, I love complex villains. So to me personally, I don't want a mustache twirling villain. I want ones that are nuanced. Um, and that not necessarily to, uh, you don't necessarily empathize with them, but you can kind of understand how they got there and there's some complexity and they're not all bad. I don't want villains that are hundred percent evil. Um, and what actually is kind of cool is the forsaken at times are not hundred percent evil. Um, so anyways, moving on, let's hear the Sean Chin with a Southern drawl. See, I could see them going this way. Think about this. Almost all the actors and actresses that they've brought on so far are British accents or European of some sort. What if all the Sean Chan speak an American dialect of English? That, I mean, that's kind of what Robert Jordan intended. Um, so how do they handle the children of the light? I think they're going to do exactly, I think they're going to make the children look I think they're going to look really bad at the beginning, just like they do in the books. And I think we're going to learn more and more about them. And then there's going to be people that kind of children of the light that understand there's a worldview outside of theirs. And frankly, guys, I mean, I hate to get meta on us and talk about, but that's, that's the way that we make change in the world. Uh, me telling you that you're wrong and that you're an idiot about name some political discussion that causes a lot of, uh, a lot of debate. If I say you're an idiot, you're wrong. We don't have change, but when we learn to understand why people think the way they think, that's when we can affect the change we want in the world. And I need to learn to think the way other people think. And that's what this book does such a good job of bringing up, is you've got these people that have these entrenched belief systems that are forced to address that in one way or another. So you've got the, you've got the, uh, the, the children of the light that have a very set view of the world, and they believe it's black and white. And so what you end up having is they're forced, Galat is forced to confront that not everything is black and white. That's central to, to, to Galad's character arc. And that's how he ends up following, and you've got Dane Bornhold following Perrin Barra, who they thought was a dark friend, who was a part of, you know, killing Children of the Light. Like, they make that decision, and they fight alongside Aes Sedai at the end. So in a sense, the Children of the Light are a have a character arc of their own. And so I, I do think there is some redemption there. Um, I see some people making uh, comments that they're sort of like the KKK. And I, 
I, I don't know if I'd go that far as to say they're like the KKK because the KKK are deliberately a hate group. So that's uh, the children of the light just think they're right. Um, they're much more like the Knights Templar. Um, so I, I certainly see that uh, as, and then you also got the Shan Chan and you've got this re re revelation that their whole society is based on this idea that Damani need to be chained, but yet the Soldom also need to be chained. And that finding that out and watching their society having to deal with that and at first justify it, that's a part of the conversation that I think is really, really cool. Thank you, John Turner. I uh, appreciate it, man. Uh, do you cut the Elaine love story to make it longer? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, do I cut Elaine? I don't think they should cut out the love story with Elaine at all. Um, because I, I really think um, I think she lends a lot of I think Min is the most realistic of the I think their chemistry is the best. I think Avienda is the most realistic in terms of falling in love because you can kind of watch that happen. They get more time together. I think Elaine is more of an intellectual equal with Rand and I love that dichotomy. Um, I love that she's able to advise him and she respects him for what he is more so than anybody else does. I just don't want to see him cut it, I guess. I'll put it that way. Uh, Neil Oliver, thank you so much, man. Uh, Forsaken that you were the most looking forward to seeing. Uh, so I'm going to make this tied. My two favorite Forsaken are Grendel and not my favorite Forsaken, but I'm looking forward to seeing is Lanfear. And here's why. I feel like Lanfear had the potential to be the best of all of them, and she just, I just didn't like her arc as much. So I'm looking forward to seeing how they do Lanfear, and I love Grendel. I just, I think she's the best written of the Forsaken, in my opinion. Um, she's intelligent. She plays people off of their assumptions of her. Um, she's effective at what she does. She's adequately aware of her own power, unlike some of the other Forsaken who think they're invincible. Um, she's realistic and smart. I just I think Grendel is the best of the Forsaken, in my opinion. Um, I, I love her as a character, and I also love how her motive. I think her motivations are more real. Let's put it this way, guys. I think she is the one that makes the most sense because you've got these people that were taught. She was taught growing up. Think of a pastor's kid. Think of a somebody that grows up in the Amish, for instance, or a good example, the Amish community. Somebody that grows up in a very sheltered refined like here's what you do type society which is what she did she was that's what she was she was a psychologist that was a um, very plain she was given ultimate power and the freedom to do whatever she wanted without consequence right so you you take a, use the Amish example of somebody leaving they forget what that's called where they leave the community and go out and experience the world she could do that with no consequence has almost extreme power what would some? What would most people do in those? Rum Springer, thank you. What would most people do when they are presented with this ability to go do whatever they want? They become hedonists, and that's exactly what she is. Um, I think she makes sense, but then she also is so smart that she learns to use that uh, hedonism as a shield for what she's actually doing. She she makes people think that she's just crazy and really she's awesome. So I love her. She's my favorite of the Forsaken. Um, I, I don't know if you all agree or not, but now Semarag is the one that's the most evil. She's just scary. I want them to show more Din um, or Ishamel. I I like Ishamel being crazy, and then I want more Din to be such a cold, calculated um, puppet string guy. Like that's that's what I want to see out of him. So. Anywho, um, Ravine needs to be like James Bond. Is that is that because most people, I think, I mean, everybody wants to see uh, Idris Elba as Ravine, and Idris Elba's been linked to James Bond, so maybe that's where you're getting that. Um, so, okay. Daniel Green, what up, my friend? Thank you uh, for the donation, my man. Uh, Taim's arc, one of the most underrated in my opinion. Agreed. 100% agreed. Um, I, I I love that the you could see the forced, um, when he's put under Rand, like he views himself coming to Rand thinking that he's going to be put as an equal or just a step below and, and having follow him around, be a part of his life. And then Rand says, I want you to run a school. And you can see that 
frustration uh, well up within him about that. Um, and I love that moving like that. You can kind of see like if he wasn't already a dark friend at that point, you can see how he could be easily manipulated in to becoming one. And I actually hope that's what they do. I hope if they show Taim as an independent character rather than being demon, I know there's speculation that he may the that he may be demon dread in this story. I hope they don't do that, number one. But uh, if they keep it where he's an independent character, I would rather him not be a dark friend when he comes to Rand. I would rather see him be spurned in some way, shape, or form and then turn. I know that he wasn't, but I wish that I, I want it to play out that way. Okay, if that makes sense. So, should they show the forced turning of the Ashaman and also the Aes Sedai or how brutally violent that is? I think they will to an extent. Um, I, I think turning, uh, although turning is kind of a MacGuffin for the bad side. <laughs> uh, I it's a it's such a weird concept that you can like. What does a turned person do? How does it, how what makes them turned? Um, do they just lose empathy? Do they lose the ability? Like what, how do they follow? Like, how do they do that? Is it a form of compulsion? If it's a form of compulsion, can it be turned or reversed? So I don't know. Um, so, okay. I think Ta Taim was already being groomed before Rain Man. I agree with you. I, I a hundred percent agree with that. I just wish that he, I would like to see him not be being groomed. I would like him to see being groomed afterwards. I just think that'd be a better story. Um, so I bet Naive could heal. I bet she could too. I think, you know, I think a lot of the things that we, it would be nice to know what the nature of somebody that has been turned actually has going on. Like how do they, how do they become just an obedient servant of the dark one? Um, how does that happen? Is it a form of compulsion? I don't think it's a form of compulsion because if it was, they would just use compulsion. So it's got to be something more with their soul. So I, I don't know. Um, let me hit on some of your other comments, guys. I apologize. I am so bad at uh, getting to the comments. Um, no, Taim should be 100% a dark friend when he meets Rand. However, I'd like to see him become such a Black Aja. Uh, I'd like to see him become such via Black Aja manipulation with a bit of expansion early on the show. Uh, why? Why do you think he should be 100% dark friend when he meets Rand? Just curious. If you want to expand, I'll look for your comment on that. Um Taima Dread is the better choice. Finally get the story as originally intended. Uh, first of all, it's debatable that it was originally intended. There's some just debate back and forth that, that whether that's true or not. Um, I'm not sure it's better. I, I almost think it's kind of playing on this idea that Demon Dread would hide in a school. Like I just, it doesn't make sense for his character to me, um, for what we know. Wasn't Tarnafier turned? She'd be a logical character. Explore that she was turned. Um, I don't I, I don't know that I agree that she'd be the logical character to explore it with. I think it because characters like her are gonna get cut from the show. I think it needs to be somebody that we care about being turned. And I don't know that we cared enough about Tarna to to see her being turned. Um, here's the one thing I would love to see happen that I think Game of Thrones was really good at that I feel like the wheel of time and the show adaptation could change. I want to see, the villains do things that affect the characters that we like more. Okay. So a good example of that would be um, when Fane kills Perrin's family, like that is direct, like that makes Fane a bad guy. I want, like, I would like to see people turned that we care about or somebody die that we care about because that now you don't want to overdo that, but that really pulls us in. Oh, Daniel Green again. Thank you, sir. Uh, rank the characters. Loghain, Taim, Tam, Tom, and Hopper. Oh, he's going to get so mad at me, and he did this on purpose because he knows how I feel. Uh, if I rank them from the books in terms of the quality of the character, I'm going to go this way. Tom, Taim, Tam, Hopper, Loghain from the books. Now, in terms of how I think they're you know, how I think they're written or what quality of character they are. How I think it'll be in the show, I think we're going to see Loghain, Taim, and Tam highlighted a lot more. I get the feeling we're not going to see Tom as much, and I just, I don't know why I'm getting that feeling, but I am. And I'm not sure how they're going to do Hopper yet. Um, 
I, I don't know how they're going to pull off Hopper. Uh, Daniel, I am, I am, uh, I am curious to see what you think of my my picks there, considering uh, you donated that. But um, so blow me up for telling me because I know Hopper's like your number one or Tom. But um, anyways, Forsaken doing things, Simrog and some of those who she influenced in the Shan Chan, but Siroth and two. How could you? Look, man. He's a wolf, and I love it. I love him in the books. I have no idea how they're going to make him, how how they're going to make Hopper feel so real in the show. Like I, I, I the that that could come across so cheesy if they don't do it right. Okay, so they they've got to somehow make that communication real. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, and then from the Tom standpoint, I I love Tom. So I want to be very very clear here. I love Tom, um, but he really isn't. If you really look at it, he's not a major character. He's a side character in almost every plot. He's never the main character. He's never the main arc. <clears throat> Uh, he's never the main arc um, in any of the stories he's in. So I, I just that's why I don't think they're going to cast somebody unless it is Michael Mickelhatton as him. I don't see them casting a huge, uh, a huge uh, actor as Tom, just because he's never the main character. He is a, a again well put. Tom is a fan favorite side character like Brienne of Tarth. Agreed. Yes, hundred percent. Uh, he's never the main character, but he is a great side character. I think he has a lot of nuance as a side character. Uh, but, um, Nabeless and uh, Daniel, you should wear each other's merch. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I am going to be ordering quite a bit of Daniel Green merch uh, because you all should buy Daniel Green's merch. And you should subscribe if you have not already done so. To Again, I don't believe that there's a single person on this stream that watches my channel that isn't subscribed to Daniel Green. Uh, but if you aren't, uh, you should subscribe to Daniel Green. And since we've got a lot of new people on here, I will, I'll do this one more time here. I'm going to link three people that are relatively new um, Wheel of Time content creators here on YouTube that I want you guys to follow and um, give them some uh, shout out. It is the uh, Wheel of Time Theory channel which he's a relatively new guy. He's got a cool accent, so that that is great right off the bat. You've got the Dusty Wheel, which is outstanding content. It's a call-in TV show uh, on YouTube, um, and they do outstanding stuff. So I link, got that linked, and then there is a Wheel of Time music, like so composition stuff that I was linked that I'll link here as well. Check those guys out. Give them a follow. Um, I would link Daniel Green's channel, but again, you guys all know I can link Daniel Green's channel. We'll do that. Even if you all, most of you would imagine are already following Daniel. But, hey, what the heck, I'm going to get anyway because you all, you all should be. He released a video today. As a matter of fact, uh, he's the bomb. Check his channel out. Also, feel free to join our Discord server here. Um, MK linked to Facebook group. Check that out. These are all, all different ways that you can get involved in the Wheel of Time community, guys. Uh, so, anyways, um, who is Daniel Green? I have no idea. He's never heard of him before. Never heard of that dude. Um, okay. All right, Ross, we're going to do it right now because you're giving me crap about it. I need to tell my Wheel of Time theory about Ishamael since Naples won't talk about it. I won't talk about it because it's wrong, but if you really want, I will do a video on it. And, uh, yeah. I'll rip your theory apart in a video if that's what you really, really want, because um, it's wrong. But any case, uh, <laughs> so okay, guys. Uh, what else? Like, what are some other things? Stubble McShave. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, Tom is great for exp exposition scenes. He is. So there's a couple characters that are in um, Eye of the World that are great for exposition. Obviously, Moraine is great. Tom is great, and Loyal are great. Those are the three main, and then you get Varen later on takes on that role as well. Um, they are great for exposition. I'm curious, though, because exposition is a notoriously awful way of making a, a show. 
it's much better in book form. So obviously they want to avoid doing exposition as much as possible. So they need to do it. Guys, and this is, again, it's controversial the way they did it. Game of Thrones did exposition. Uh, oh, I'll mean pause and say thank you, Daniel, again. Appreciate it, buddy. Thank, thanks for checking us out. Obviously, uh, uh, like and subscribe Daniel's channel as well. Um, but so real quick here, uh, Game of Thrones, what they did with their exposition. This has been documented. This is true. They did what's called sex position. And what they did is they grouped a lot of the exposition scenes where they needed to exposit. They needed to talk and set up the world. They put those in sex scenes because what it did is it distracted people that were watching from understanding that they were having exposition come at them. Like they were, it didn't seem like exposition because it was happening during a sex scene. A good example of that, there's a scene in like the second episode where they're in uh, Littlefinger's brothel and there's people doing, and he's talking about the world and the wars and things like that while there's, he's coaching prostitutes, like for lack of a better way of putting it. And again, I'm not saying that's the best way to do it, but it's how they tried to keep from making exposition a big part of their show, okay? So I do think they need to be careful with characters like Tom as having him just be an exposition machine. Um, exposition is a bad way of telling your story in a TV show. So I think they need to be very careful about that, okay? And yes, that's what it's called, by the way. Sex position is what they called it, and they did that deliberately. Um, it wasn't, that was why they put that in in the first, and that's why, by the way, in Game of Thrones, the sex and nudity died down a ton after the first couple episodes of the first season. Like, it was not nearly what it was in those first couple episodes because they did that deliberately. They were trying to shatter a trope. They were trying to make people that thought of fantasy as being Lord of the Rings. They wanted to bring in people that would never watch that, and that's what they did. Um, and that's why it got as popular as it did. So... Dusty Will's camera is insanely good. It absolutely is, guys. They, they Those guys are, are on top of it. Um, so it's pretty good. So uh, we're going to wrap up here in the next couple minutes, guys. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, thank you all for, for joining. Um, I wanted to say a couple things here real quick. So first of all, check out the Discord server. There, the link is in the description of this video if you want to hop in and be a part of our ongoing discussions. Uh, I also want to ask you guys this. So I, I'll give a, I, I did this in my video and some of you gave me flack for it. I really don't care. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't do a whole lot of self-promotion, but we are in the middle of building. Uh, I've got a couple people as a team that are helping to build. We're making a new wheel of time fan site. Um, and it, it's going to be a kind of a combination of a lot of different things. We're putting together a, um, a site where we can have like a rebuilt wiki that's a lot more functional. So it'll have links to a lot of different content. We're going to have a place where there's blogs where even you guys can submit stuff that you want to blog out and have people read that. I want to be able to highlight new creators. Um, all of this stuff, interactive maps where you can click areas on the map and then bring up information on it. Like this is all what's happening, guys, in the background. Um, but I do need your help. Um, to, to build that. I need to be able to hire on people like MK um, to work for this. And, and so because of that, I would love to point you all to the Patreon. If you want to support what I'm doing here, my goal is just to keep growing the community. Um, and all of the money that comes into the channel goes back into the channel. Um, I don't do this for money, but I do want to be able to reinvest. And so as a part of that, if you want to check out the Patreon, there's a lot of cool links and support what I'm doing here. And if you want to support the website and things like that, I very, very much appreciate it. Don't feel like you have to, but if you would like to be a part of that, please be a part of that. Please be a part of our Discord community. Um, check out the merch. Uh, there's more than this, uh, but definitely do that. Um, and I appreciate all of you guys. Uh, it's a, uh, It's been a lot of fun growing this. We're, we're coming up now on about a year of the channel, and we've hit 12,000 subscribers almost in a year, which I'm really, really pumped about. Um, and so I appreciate all of you guys. Um, and, and we'll, we'll keep doing these. I'm going to have a patron only live chat coming up where it'll be a lot more, uh, a lot more intimate of a setting. Um, and so if you want to be a part of some of those patron only live chats, um, uh, become a patron, you can do it for as little as a buck a month. Um, and I've got a couple folk, couple of you that are supporting me for more than a hundred a month. So I, I appreciate everybody and thank you guys. Uh, 
we're going to end this now. So hop in the Discord if you want to keep that chat going. And I appreciate all of you. Hey, guys, thank you. Take care.